I want to invite you to open up a Bible with me today. If you don't have a Bible, maybe you have a phone with you. I want to invite you to maybe take out your, your, your Bible app on your phone too. There's something cool about engaging that and following along together. Uh, if you don't have either of those, the text will be on the screen behind me as well. And we're going to continue in the Gospel of Mark as we've been doing this whole season of Lent. Today we're going to get into Mark chapter 10. We're going to be reading from verses 46 to chapter 11, verse 11. So hear now the word of the Lord. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet. But he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage at Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you'll find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, And others spread leafy branches that they cut out of the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. What do you want from me? What do you want me to do for you? Imagine if someone asked you this. What do you want me to do for you? Imagine if Jesus asked you this. Jesus, fully God, fully divine. Imagine if Jesus asked you this. What do you want me to do for you? Well, I wanted to know how people might answer that question and so I did what we all do when we wonder something I googled it (laughs) I googled uh, what do people want and and I found a lot of answers to that question of of what do you want I found the best answers on a a social media platform called reddit if you're not familiar this is sort of a, a social media platform that allows for conversation forums I found a lot of answers and here are some of the most common ones Uh, People said that they wanted peace. To answer the question, what do you want? Or what do you want more than anything? People said peace. Peace for themselves. Peace for their families. Peace for their country, their neighborhood. A whole wide spectrum of what they wanted peace for. A number of people said they want more than anything better relationships. Relationships with their family, relationship with neighbors or friends. Just stronger, deeper, more authentic relationships relationships. Some people said they want lots and lots of money, or they want financial stability. They want to be able to live a life they want to live without having to worry about the financial uh, responsibility with that. A number of people wanted to know what their purpose in life is, what they're created to do, what they're called to do. What does it mean that they have gifts and passions that they have? Many people said they want more than anything a fulfilling job. 
to know that they're going to go to work and contribute and be satisfied. Surprisingly, a lot of people said they just want a good dog. (laughs) Sometimes it's the little things, right? But what I learned was this is a broad spectrum. There are infinite answers to that question of what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? There's so many questions. The answers are as infinite as the people answering them. Today, today is Palm Sunday. It's the day that we remember and we celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry back into the city of Jerusalem. It's the day that we enter into Holy Week, which is the the climax of this season of Lent that we've been walking through. But interestingly, before Mark is going to get into this entry into Jerusalem, Mark gives us this little story that is extremely profound of this interaction between Jesus and, and a beggar, a beggar named Bartimaeus in Jericho that Jesus and the crowd run into on their way. So before we enter the city, let's look at this a little bit more. This is really profound for us as we live as disciples in 2021. Now, Mark says that Bartimaeus is sitting on the side of the road and he notices that something's changing. Even though Bartimaeus is blind, he can tell something is happening. He can tell the crowd is, 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 is grow, the excitement is growing, the atmosphere is changing, the crowd is changing. Something is going on. The pace is quickening around him and he can tell. He can sense it. And when he learns that it's Jesus, he shouts out to Jesus to say, I want you to give me mercy. He shouts out because he knows that Jesus can give mercy. But something kind of embarrassing happens. Somebody rebukes. It says, Mark says, many rebuked Bartimaeus for speaking up. Many said, hey, be quiet. Don't shout out to Jesus. But he's not going to be denied. He's not going to be kept quiet. He's not going to miss his chance to go see Jesus and ask for mercy. Jesus hears him, and Jesus notices him. He notices this one blind beggar. Think about that. Jesus is walking through these streets with a crowd all around him, it's loud, it's, it's full of people, and full of people that are walking and, and, and seeing, can do all the things, that, right, that Bartimaeus can't. And Jesus notices among all the crowd, he notices this one blind beggar. And as Jesus often does, he notices this one person that's on the margins and welcomes this person on the margin to come to him. In an instant, Bartimaeus, who is being told by many, hey, just be quiet. Jesus is busy. Let him go. In in, in a second, Bartimaeus is brought from the outside as close into Jesus as possible. Mark writes that Bartimaeus threw off his cloak. He sprang up and went to Jesus. And this is key. This is profound. This is maybe the most vital part of this story with Jesus and Bartimaeus. Why? Because this throwing off the cloak, this setting aside the cloak, this maybe even discarding the cloak is extremely unexpected. Here's why. First century Palestine, which is where this is happening, in in that time and place, cloaks were extremely valuable. Oftentimes, a cloak was a person's most valuable possession. And especially a blind beggar like Bartimaeus, this would have been his most, it may have been his only possession, not just his most valuable, it may have been his only possession. And these cloaks, they were, they, they were multifunctional. This wasn't like a jacket, right? We put on a jacket, we put our arms in a jacket, we zip up a coat and we kind of know what that means. That's not what a cloak was you can see on the screen it's used multiple different ways it was used as a a a thing to keep people warm to cover the wearer from the cold it it could serve as a, a blanket at night it could serve as something to lay down on 
It could serve as all those things. And it could serve as, uh, for, for a beggar, it could serve as sort of a, a sheet or a, a blanket that they could lay out in front of them and collect all the coins and collect all the things that people would give Bartimaeus. And he could kind of wrap it all up in a cloak. This cloak is extremely important. But in a moment, in an instant, when Jesus says, come to me, Bartimaeus tosses it aside. The most valuable possession he owns, he tosses it aside. Think about this, right? A, a blind man. Bartimaeus is blind. He, he can't look back and keep an eye on his cloak. He, he, we get no indication that Mark said that he like elbowed a buddy and said, hey, keep an eye on this cloak for me. We get no indication that Bartimaeus brought it with just in case, right? Maybe I'll bring my cloak with just in case this Jesus thing doesn't pan out. None of that happened. He, he threw it aside and sprang up to Jesus. It's a pretty beautiful picture of trust and faith. Frankly, a, a picture of faith and trust that rivals that of the disciples up to this point. The other thing I want to notice is this, that last week we looked at this rich young ruler who came to Jesus and said, Jesus, what must I do to enter the kingdom of God? And do you remember what Jesus said? Jesus said, go sell all your stuff, give the money to the poor, and then come back and follow me. And the rich young man said, ooh, ooh, that's going to be hard. And he didn't. He, he didn't do that. He walked away from Jesus because the loss of his stuff and status and wealth was too much, and he walked away from Jesus. But Bartimaeus responds very differently. Jesus asked the question, what do you want? More specifically, Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? It's a little bit of weight there isn't there? Jesus, fully God, says to this blind beggar, what do you want me to do for you? Now remember, just a few verses above this, if you've been reading along with us in the, the Mark reading plan, you'll know that, that Jesus asked this same question of two of his disciples, James and John, and do you remember what they said? Jesus said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said, well, we'd like to be on either side of you in glory, nothing major, right? We'd just like to be exalted with you in glory. Notice the contrast here between these two disciples and Bartimaeus. Think of all the ways that Bartimaeus could have answered. Think of all the things that, that would have been difficult for Bartimaeus. Think of all the things that he might have wanted for his life. Maybe, maybe he just wanted a good dog. Who knows what he wanted? But we know how he answers. He simply answers, let me see again. And Jesus does. And what's so interesting then, Bartimaeus is healed. He can see again. But he doesn't go back to life as usual. Mark gives us no indication that Bartimaeus just goes back to his cloak we get no indication that Bartimaeus just takes his sight and goes and gets a job to support himself or goes to find a, a, a partner or a, a spouse or whatever the case is. We get no indication of that. Rather, Mark says this, that Bartimaeus followed Jesus on the way. He's going forward with Jesus. He never went back to his cloak on the way with Jesus. The question is, what does that mean? What does it mean to go on the way with Jesus? Where is Bartimaeus following Jesus to? Literally, he's following Jesus to Jerusalem, but figuratively, he's following Jesus on the way of discipleship, on the way of becoming a disciple. He's following Jesus to become like Jesus, to learn from Jesus to experience the way that Jesus lives and teaches. And today, on Palm Sunday, today is so helpful for us in understanding what that means. It's so helpful for us in understanding what it means to follow Jesus on the way of discipleship. 
Let me say more about that. Remember the scripture I read at the beginning of the, of, of the service. Jesus enters the city as a king and fulfills this prophecy from Zechariah that says this. I'm going to read this again for you. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you, triumphant and victorious is he. Humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. This is him. This is the king. This is the Messiah. This is the one that all of God's people have been waiting for, for generations and generations. The one that will set all things right. He's here. He's come. Right in front of them, here he is. Imagine the scene, right? We see the palm branches waving. We, we imagine the shouts of Hosanna. Hosanna is a Hebrew word that comes from one of the Psalms that literally means, save us now. So these shouts of Hosanna are, are shouts of request, of shouts of affirmation, of recognition that this one, this one Jesus, would in fact save us now. The wait is over. There is no more waiting. Here he is. If we were there, we'd see these palm branches laid all along the street. We'd see cloaks. Remember the significance of cloaks. Remember these valuable possessions. Now we see them laid out on the ground for Jesus to ride in on. And don't forget what this is, this sign with things on the ground for the person riding in on. This is an explicit outward sign of kingship. This is how a, a municipal king or a political king would come into the city with his people cheering and exalting, creating this path for him to ride on. There's no doubt what the people are saying, that this is the king and he's here being cheered and exalted by his people. And yet, amidst the shouts of Hosanna, amidst the cloaks and the palms and the crowds, amidst all of that, here is Jesus. Here is the king that they're cheering and exalting, riding into Jerusalem on a borrowed colt that had never been ridden before. That feels different, doesn't it? This is the way that Bartimaeus is following. This is the way that Jesus' disciples were following. This is the way that we are invited to follow Jesus on the way. This is the kind of discipleship that Jesus invites us to, the, the kind where the king of the kingdom, the king of all kings, humbles himself to ride a colt. See, when these kings would enter town, they would come in on war horses. They would come in in chariots and ornate garments and, and, and armor. And yet Jesus is a king that doesn't do that. This is the invitation that we follow on the way that we see a king ruling not with military power, not with military might, not with any sort of power that we might traditionally assign to a king, but rather a king that rules with grace and mercy and love and compassion a king that's establishing a kingdom that we're invited to a kingdom in which the citizens reflect the same sort of value of of not power and might but of mercy and compassion and love but that's not all for Bartimaeus for for you for me this following Jesus on the way is about even, even more than that. It's about more than just a, a set of rules or a set of behaviors to follow. It's about seeing Jesus for who he really is. It's about seeing Jesus as your personal Savior. Not as a scolder, not as one that stands above you with a gavel waiting to punish you. Not as one that looks to, to take your fun away. Not as one that, that looks at your every movement and just waits to punish you. No, following Jesus on the way is about seeing Jesus for who he really is. And it's about following him into a place of radical acceptance 
radical belonging. Even the blind beggar. Even you and me, just common people, you and me. Even people that that we might look at right now and say, wow, those people are far from God. All of us are welcomed into that place, into that kingdom, into that place of acceptance and grace and mercy. And it's open for all that ask for it. Even for you. See, this life of discipleship, this seeing Jesus for who he really is, for following Jesus on the way of riding into a city on a borrowed colt. It's about uh, sensing and receiving you and me personally, receiving this, this grace, this, this radical acceptance. It's about understanding that you and I can have a home, that you and I can have a name because Jesus rode into the city and establishes a kingdom that's so upside down, where expectations are flipped on their head, where the king doesn't show up with secret service, but the king shows up on a colt, where the king doesn't flex his muscles, but the king shows grace and meekness. Friends, this is the good news. This is the gospel. This is the most beautiful story that that we have. This is the most beautiful story that we get to share in together. This is the story that we get to tell our neighbors. This is the story that we get to tell our coworkers. The story that there's grace and acceptance from this king who rides in so humbly to establish his kingdom. This is why Bartimaeus left his most valuable possession behind. This is why people put down their their cloaks on the road for Jesus to ride in on. This is why people shout Hosanna. This is why we wave branches this morning. This is why we sing, because the king has come. The king has arrived to make all of this so. To make all of this reality for you and for me. It's not just good news, though. It's also a call. Just like Bartimaeus received grace and mercy, so do we. We aren't given this grace and mercy, though. We aren't gifted with this so that we can receive it and then go back to our cloaks. We aren't given this grace and mercy so that we can receive it and then just go back to life as usual. No, we receive it and then we're sent. We're called to go. Just like Bartimaeus followed on the way, so are we called to follow and called to go. We're called to be instruments right where we are, instruments of, of grace, instruments of mercy in our homes, in our workplaces, in our schools, in our classrooms, at the soccer field, at the baseball field, in our gyms, wherever it is that we find ourselves, we're called to go. We get sent out, armed with the gospel, equipped by the Holy Spirit to be agents of acceptance, of belonging, of healing, of hope, of love and compassion. And we're sent this way not for our own sake, not for the sake of filling up our chairs or meeting our budget or anything like that. We're sent and called to go to be an instrument for the sake of the kingdom, for the sake of our neighbors, for the sake of those who don't know those things, that don't know healing and hope, that don't know peace. We're called and we're sent for the sake of the creation that God loves so deeply. That includes you and me, those that he created that he longs to bring back to himself. So I want to go back to the question. The question that we started with this morning. What do you want? I want to ask you this morning. What do you want? 
What do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for Trinity Hospers? Do you, do you want to see? Do you want to see again? Do you want to see Jesus? Do you want to see Jesus so that you can leave, leave your cloak behind and follow him on the way? Do you want to see more clearly with open eyes and open hearts what it means to follow Jesus on the way, the same Jesus, the, the King of Kings that rides a borrowed colt into the city? Do you want to see with open eyes and open hearts, do you want to see those around you that God has put near you and with you so that you can be agents of healing and hope and love and compassion to them? I, I want to invite you to, to sit with that question this week. As we enter into Holy Week, I want to invite you to wrestle with that. I want to invite you to, to, to reflect on that this week. What do you want? What do you want Jesus to do for you? What do you want Jesus to do for Trinity Hospers, for the community of Hospers, for whatever community that you live in? Reflect on how Bartimaeus answered that question. Here's my prayer. My prayer is that, that we would be a, a body, a, a church that would see. I pray that we would be a, a church that follows Jesus on the way. That follows Jesus, seeing Jesus for who he really is as your personal Savior that loves you so deeply. And that we would follow. Friends, we all follow someone. Someone. And what's true is we become who we follow. We become who we follow. May we be a body that follows Jesus on the way, that leaves our cloaks behind in exchange for the grace and the mercy that's so readily available to you and to me. And may we be a church that sees with clear eyes, with open hearts that sees Jesus riding humbly. Not with might, not with brute force, not with ornate chariots and war horses, but rides humbly on a colt. And may we follow in the same way. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we are just so present to the upside-down nature of the way that Jesus entered Jerusalem. We're present to the fact that all of Jesus' life is upside-down and radical. We're present to this question of what do we want? God, would you, by your Holy Spirit, work in our wonderings, work in our reflectings this week as we wonder about this question, what do we want? Would you guide and shape that for us? Would you create in us a desire to be drawn closer to you and closer to your son Jesus? Would you create in us a desire to follow on the way? Would you give us eyes to see? hearts to follow and encouragement from each other to keep going. In Jesus' name, amen.